we will be talking about edge-to-edge -edge repair, past challenge, current case selection, and future advances. These are our disclosures. Untreated severe mitral regurgitation has an annual mortality rate of 5% or more. Half of these patients are ineligible for mitral valve surgery due to having a high operative risk. This led to the development of transcatheter mitral valve repair options, initially with the mitral clip. The mitral clip is basically a transcatheter reproduction of the alfieri stitch repair. It was first done in 2003, and subsequently it was approved for commercial use in Europe in 2008 and in the United States in 2013. Since then, it's estimated that over 100,000 mitral clip interventions have been performed worldwide. The first trial that led to the commercial approval in the United States was the Everest II trial. In this study, 279 patients with degenerative mitral regurgitation were randomized to mitral clip therapy or mitral valve surgery. Although mitral valve surgery outperformed the mitral clip therapy with respect to freedom from death, freedom from surgery for mitral valve dysfunction, and from residual high-grade mitral regurgitation, Mitral clip therapy was demonstrated to be safer with respect to major adverse events at 30 days. And subsequently, mitral clip therapy was approved for use in patients who had mitral valve regurgitation and had a high operative risk. These patients were followed up to five years and there's no difference with respect to mortality and functional status. And after one year, the need for re-intervention was similar. A closer look at the Everest II trial showed that a quarter of the patients enrolled actually had functional mitral regurgitation. Additionally, after commercial approval um, in Europe, registries show that up to three quarters of the patients who received mitral clip therapy actually had functional mitral regurgitation. This led to the question of if there was any benefit at all to mitral clip therapy in patients with functional regurgitation, bearing in mind that previous surgical literature has demonstrated that there was no benefit to surgical mitral valve interventions in patients with mitral valve regurgitation who were undergoing surgical revascularization or other surgical interventions. The first trial was the mitral FR study, and this randomized 304 patients with heart failure and severe mitral regurgitation to medical therapy or medical therapy with mitral clip. Out to one year, there was no demonstrable difference with respect to all cost mortality or heart failure hospitalization between both groups. This was followed by the COAP trial, and in the COAP trial, 614 patients with heart failure and at least moderate to severe functional mitral regurgitation were placed on maximally tolerated guideline-directed medical therapy and randomized to either continue the medical therapy or continue medical therapy and receive mitral clip intervention. Following these patients out to 24 months, there was a demonstrable difference in heart failure hospitalization between both groups and all-cause mortality, and the number needed to treat in this trial was as low as single digits. So this begs the question, why would two different trials that were designed to look at functional mitral regurgitation and the impact of mitral clip therapy in this group have widely different um, conclusions and outcomes? A closer look at the enrolled patients for both of these trials showed that in the COAP study, the patients tended to have more severe mitral regurgitation as measured by effective regurgitants orifice area on echo compared to the mitral FR patients who had less severe mitral regurgitation. Additionally, the patients with mitral FR group had more dilated left ventricle compared to the COAP trial that excluded patients with endastolic dimensions that was greater than 70 millimeters of mercury. Furthermore, follow-up of the COAP patients so that in the intervention was more likely to be associated with effective mitral regurgitation reduction to grade 2 or less in the co group and 
when you follow this patient out to 12 months, this mitral regurgitation reduction was more likely to be sustained in the COAPS group compared to the mitral FR study. And what this implies, and this projecting from real world experience where Residual mitral regurgitation is associated with worse outcomes may in part explain why the mitral FR patients who were more likely to have significant residual mitral regurgitation had less benefit from this therapy. This is an example of a patient who would have been enrolled in the Everest II trial. This patient on the top right left panel rather has posterior mitral leaflet prolapse and anteriorly directed mitral regurgitation with a main gradient of two. On the bottom panels is the transeptal puncture, which is echocardiographically guided, should happen in the inferior posterior location. And here, um, the height is measured to, at the site of the puncture to the mitral valve annular plane. This should be at least 4.5 centimeters from the mitral valve annular plane. After transeptal access is obtained, the mitral clip guide is inserted into the left atrium and the mitral clip is passed through this guide and steered down towards the mitral valve annulus. The trajectory of the, mi of the mitral clip is checked in both the anterior, posterior and mediolateral directions, the same in the top left panel. And next, the clip arm orientation is checked in 3D echo in the surgeon's view, and the clip is rotated such that the clip arms are perpendicular to the mitral valve coaptation plane. After that, the mitral clip is directed into the left ventricle and then pulled back up towards the mitral valve. This is for the grasp to be performed, the mitral valve leaflet should be tips should be buried into the recesses of the mitral clip and should be resting over the clip arms. When that is confirmed, the, grips are, the grippers are lowered, and after the grippers are lowered, the gripper bounce is one way to check to see that the mitral leaflets are buried between the grippers and the clip arms. When that is confirmed, the clip is close to 60 degrees and leaflet insertion is reassessed. The clip arm should be seen to be coming up and over the edges of the mitral clip that is partially closed. If that location is satisfactory under color, um, the mitral clip is then closed fully. And if everyone is satisfied with the mitral regurgitation reduction and the mean gradient at that location, then the clip is subsequently released. The interatrial septum is also assessed to be sure that there is no um, there's no significant right to left shunt that will require closure. So the Everest um, criteria um, was really numerous and very exact and excluded several patients that would otherwise have benefited from mitral clip therapy. This is essentially a summary of the patients that would normally have been include, included in the Everest trial. The patients had to have had central mitral regurgitation due to malcoaptation between A2P2 and have sufficient tissue for coaptation, as measured by coaptation length and coaptation depth. Patients with severe bileaflet flailor prolapse, severe leaflet tethering, and systolic dimension greater than 55, valve area less than 4, and recent myocardial infarction were all excluded from the Everest trial and, and consequently in the early experience with the use of the mitral club. So because the patients in the Everest 2 trial were highly selective, this limited the wide application of mitral clip therapy to all patients with mitral regurgitation. However, as demonstrated in the registries that were um, established in Europe after commercial approval um, of mitral clip, most of the patients who ended up receiving mitral clip therapy actually had functional mitral regurgitation. And with increasing use of the mitral clip therapy and increasing experience, they expanded the use of this technology in patients who didn't quite meet the Everest criteria. And as a result of this, there was increasing device evolution to try to meet this new demands of patients who were not necessarily um, eligible, who not have been eligible under um, the Everest 2 criteria. So this 
left clip is the NTR clip that was the one that was tested in the Everest 2 trial. It measures about 17 millimeters across with the um, clip arms open to about 120 degrees. After this to try to treat more complex anatomy led to the introduction of the XTR which has wider clip arms that measure up to 22 millimeters when the clip arms are about 120 degrees open. But even with that, there was still need for um, clip evolution to tackle even more complex anatomy safely. And this led to the development of the fourth generation clip of NTW and XTW. And the major difference is that in the wider clips, there's at least 50% wider compared to the regular size clip in the grasping area. And the thought is that there will be more effective mitral regurgitation reduction with less trauma on the leaflets. So now we'll go over the current case selection based off of these different criteria, the clip location, com complexity of the anatomy, um, valve area and calcification, ejection fraction and size, and what are the therapies for residual mitral regurgitation, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and aftermyocardial infarction. So the clip location in the Everest 2 trial mandated that the clip be deployed between A2 and P2. And in this location, it was associated with the most mitral regurgitation reduction. However, there was decrease in septolateral dimensions, which led to decrease in mitral valve area and increase in mean gradient. The mitral clip has been found to be, can be safely deployed closer to the commissures. And in this location, there's less impact on the mean gradient and um, however, this should be balanced against the risk of increased risk of um, interaction with the cords. So this is an example of a patient with severe mitral regurgitation who was planned to have a mitral clip. And at the A2P2 location of the clip, the main gradient was noted to be 8 millimeters of mercury. The clip was then moved slightly laterally, as seen on this lower right panel. And the mitral regurgitation reduction was satisfactory at this location, and the main gradient measured 4 millimeters of mercury, and therefore the clip was deployed at this location. Patients with complex anatomy, including those with multiple jets or large fill gaps, were excluded from the Everest trial. However, the newer clip designs with longer and broader arms have been developed to try to tackle this complex valve anatomy, which in, with the previous iterations of the mitral clip were left with higher risk of residual mitral regurgitation as a tendent negative impact on outcomes. Now, the clinical outcomes of patients who received this longer and broader clips, that is the XTR and the and the gen, generation 4 clips, the NTW and the XTW is being evaluated in the expand and expand G4 registries respectively. So this is an example of a patient with complex valve anatomy who has bilifluid prolapse and severe mitral regurgitation who was referred after an initial attempt with an XTR clip did not lead to significant um, mitral regurgitation reduction. So this complex anatomy was effectively tackled with the two XTW clip, and we can see from this bottom panel the significant reduction in mitral regurgitation with the main gradients that was actually measured to be about three millimeters of mercury. In patients with Main gradients greater than 4, valve area less than 4, mitral annular calcification were again excluded from the Everest trial. However, in real world experience in the United States, as evaluated from the STS TBT registry, up to 20% of mitral clips were performed in this subgroup of patients, and this did not negatively impact outcomes. This implies that in carefully selected patients, even with some of the above criteria, the mitral clip can still be safely um, performed without negative impact. With respect to LV function and size, um, it's already been demonstrated from registries that 
the an ejection fraction of less than 30% is an independent predict of mortality. And again, from the differences that we're seeing in the mitral FR and the COAPS tri trial, dilated left ventricle impacts outcomes and benefits from mitral clip therapy in patients with functional mitral regurgitation. And, and the subgroup of patients who have been found to have the most benefits are those who have ejection fraction of at least 20% and end systolic dimension that has been extended up to 17 millimeters um, so far. This is an example of a patient who came in with my myocardial infarction required LAD and um, left circumflex intervention. However, was requiring vasopressors and inotropes due to um, cardiomyopathy with severe mitral regurgitation that was refractory to these medications as well as trials of um, afterload reduction. As you can see that this is severe mitral posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation and this pulmonary vein flow reversal. This was tackled with two NTW clips and we can see that there's a significant reduction in mitral regurgitation and the pulmonary vein flow reversal has resolved. This allowed this patient to be weaned off of all pharmacologic um, left ventricular support and discharge within the week. In patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the mitral clip has been used to placate the mitral valve, therefore limiting systolic anterior motion and in turn reducing left ventricular outflow gradient. In the early experience of this therapy um, led to improved LVOT gradient, improved left atrial pressure, and consequently um, reduced symptoms. So this is a patient who has systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve with commensurate posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation who was treated with placation of the mitral valve with the mitral clip. After this, the LVOT gradient by invasive hemodynamics was seen to decrease from 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury to 25 to 30 millimeters of mercury. Patients with previous surgical mitral repair would have been excluded from the Everest trial, but more contemporary experience shows that these patients when they are well selected can also be treated with mitral clip therapy. A couple of technical things to bear in mind is that after surgical mitral valve repair with a ring, the mitral annulus is reduced and therefore these patients after mitral clip therapy have an increased risk for residual mean gradient. So in this patient, the clip was performed to the ring and this led to significant mitral regurgitation reduction as seen in this lower left panel. And therefore, this patient did not require vidurgical intervention for recurrent mitral regurgitation. So, as due to patient necessity, improvements in the device and imaging, interventional cardiology, and global experience, the mitral clip technology and procedure has Therefore, from the initial anatomic Everest criteria on this left corner, the more contemporary criteria shows that mitral clip therapy can be performed in the commissures and even for um, flail gap and flail width that were previous exclusions, this has been over overcome with the newer clips and techniques. In patients who have valve area of less than 4, this um, from the SCS registry can be performed but should not be done in patients with um, mitral valve area less than 3.5. And even after surgical repair, mitral clip therapy is still feasible. And um, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients who do not want um, to undergo surgery or are not ideal candidates for alcohol septal ablation, either due to septal anatomy or a desire to avoid pacemaker therapy, this is also a possibility. And based off of all of these experiences, the current manufacturer inclusion and exclusion criteria for mitral clip use has been simplified to, on, to 
basically cover those who have significant primary mitral regurgitation at high surgical risk or secondary mitral regurgitation who have symptoms despite guideline directed medical therapy. And the major exclusions are endocarditis, rheumatic um, and rheumatic mitral valve disease. So even with you know how effective mitral clip therapy has become over the years, there is still a risk of recurrent mitral regurgitation that will need repeat interventions. And we know that when there's residual mitral regurgitation that is more than moderate, it's associated with worse outcomes, and therefore these should be treated. Most recurrent mitral regurgitations can be treated with additional clips. However, if there's an elevated mean mitral gradient, this would preclude additional mitral clips. And other transcatheter methods have been devised to be used in conjunction with um, patients who have pre-existing clips to address this recurrent mitral valve disease. So this is an example of a patient who had recurrent mitral regurgitation despite having clips. This was then treated with a plug that was placed in between clips, effectively reducing the mitral valve regurgitation without significantly impacting the gradients. The other advances are for transcatheter mitral valve replacement after mitral clips and newer technologies for edge to edge repair. So, with the recent um, availability of transcatheter mitral valve replacement options, patients who had pre existing mitral clips are an ineligible for further treatment with mitral clips when they have recurrent mitral regurgitation can still receive transcatheter mitral valve interventions with electrosurgical techniques that involve cutting the anterior tissue mitral bridge and then opening the mitral valve orifice and allowing implantation of transcatheter mitral valve at that location as is demonstrated here. Other transcatheter edge to edge repair technologies are the Pascal device, which is currently um, undergoing trials in the United States and is approved for commercial use in Europe. This is essentially a spacer that is connected to two paddles that allow attachment of the spacer to the mitral valve leaflets and therefore reducing mitral regurgitation. Thank you for listening.